Welcome to lecture 19 of CS182. Today we're going to discuss the last uh, category of generative models that we're going to cover in this course called generative adversarial networks. All right, so uh, let's uh, briefly rewind back to latent variable models. In a latent variable model, you have some latent variable z, which, you know, latent variable is just a fancy way of saying a vector of random numbers. And those random numbers are sampled from some distribution that you choose, p of z. So for instance, you might say that my latent variable has 256 dimensions, each of which will be sampled from a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1. So it's not anything intelligent, we just pick some random distribution. And then we're going to have a neural network that represents the distribution over x given z, or a deterministic mapping from x to z, like we saw with normalizing flows. So it basically takes these random vectors z, treats them essentially as uh, random number generators, and uses them to produce a corresponding image. And the idea is that a model of this sort can capture a distribution over images, like for instance all possible dogs, by treating z as a random number denoting which particular dog you want. Okay, and using a, a model of this sort for generation simply entails sampling z from your known p of z distribution, which is basically a fancy way of saying, let's generate a bunch of random numbers, and then sampling your image according to your neural net p of x given z, or if you have a deterministic transformation, then just applying that deterministic neural net to z. So turn that vector of random numbers into an image. So the idea that we're going to explore in today's lecture is that instead of training an encoder like we did with uh, VAEs, can we just train the whole model to generate images that look similar to real images at the population level? So instead of trying to guess for every real image what its corresponding z is and then using that to supervise our network, what if we just uh, generate a bunch of random images and then try to alter our network so that those random images at the population level resemble uh, the population of realistic images given to us in our training set. Okay, so this might seem a little bit abstract, and maybe it'll be easier to see with an example. Let's say that I have two sets of faces, okay? The set on the left and the set on the right. Both of them are collections of faces, and the faces are not uh, paired with each other. It's not like for every face on the left, there's some corresponding face on the right. They're just two different distributions over faces. Uh, no two faces are the same, but they look kind of similar at the population level. So if, if I were to uh, take these distributions of faces and uh, take, you know, let's say five samples from one distribution and five samples from the other distribution, maybe you would not be able to tell which distribution those came from. In that case, we would say that these two distributions are similar at the population level. But if these were different, if I were to pick five from one and five from the other, show them to you, and you would immediately be able to tell which one came from which, then they are not similar at the population level. So this is how we can basically try to match distributions without our having to figure out what the latent variables for any particular image actually are. Uh, now, of course, here I might also ask you, well, can you guess which set of faces is actually real? I'm going to tell you that, uh, that some of these faces were actually, in fact, generated by a latent variable model. Which one do you think it was? Which set is real? Well, it's actually a trick question. So both sets of faces here are actually fake. None of them are real photographs. They all came from a generative model, and in fact, not even a particularly good one. Um, so these kinds of models that match distributions at the population level can get extremely good and much better than this. Okay. So here's how we're going to set this up. We're going to set up a game where the only moving, where the only winning move is to generate realistic images. So the idea is to train a network, which is going to guess which images are real and which are fake. So this is going to be essentially a classifier, just like the classifiers we learned about in computer vision. It's a classifier that looks at an image and then it outputs a uh, binary label, either true or false. So in reality, this classifier is going to output a probability, a number between zero and one, and uh, that's going to be the probability that this image is a real image, okay? Now, in order to train a network like this, all you need is a label training set, a set of images with true labels and a set of images with 
false labels. Okay? So where could we get these? We need real images and we need fake images. Okay? Well, the fake images, uh, those can come from our generative model. So maybe initially our generative model is not very good, it's just kind of randomly initialized. That's going to give us a bunch of fake images, about a bunch of awful looking images that don't look like real photographs. And that's going, and we're going to take those images and we're going to label them with the label false. And then our true images, of course, will come from our training set. So those are real photographs that some person actually took in the world, and those we will collect in our training set and label them as true. Okay, so now we have everything we need to train this classifier that's going to look at a picture and output the probability that it is a real picture. All right, and this model can then serve as a loss function for our generator. What we can do is we can then take our generator, uh, our um, model that turns Z's into X's, and its loss function could be the realism score of the resulting image as produced by this classifier. So that's the basic intuition behind this approach. We're going to essentially learn a loss function by training uh, a classifier to classify between fake images and real images. And then we will use this as a loss, a negative loss, for our generator to get the images that it generates to be more real according to this classifier. So we have two networks. We have this classifier, which we call a discriminator, because it attempts to discriminate whether the image is real or not. And then we have our generator, which, for the sake of simplicity, is just going to be a deterministic function, just like in normalizing flows. Uh, it's going to map a vector of random number z to images, uh, so there's no uh, x given z, it's just a deterministic mapping. You can have it be a stochastic mapping too, but it's a little simpler with a deterministic mapping. Unlike normalizing flows here, it does not have to be invertible. The dimensionality does not have to match. So it's just like the, the VAE decoder, only uh, instead of outputting a distribution, it just outputs a single image. All right. So here is a potential algorithm. This is not the final algorithm, but this is how we're going to work our way up to the final algorithm. First, get a true data set, a data set of real images that we're going to call DT. Where do we get this true data set? Well, that's, that's what's provided to us. That's our training data, basically. It's just a collection of real photographs. Get a generator g theta of z. So z is going to parameterize our generator. Where do we get the generator? Well, wherever you want. You could initialize it randomly using Xavier initialization. So it doesn't have to be a good generator. Okay. Step three, generate a false data set. Typically, you would generate a false data set of the same size as the real one. Uh, and we'll call, it, we'll call it df. So sample a bunch of z's from the prior and then get their corresponding x's by passing those z's through g. And that gives you a data set of fake images. And if your generator was very bad, these fake images might look terrible. Then train your discriminator, which is just a classifier that tries to predict whether the image came from the true data set or the false one. So you construct your training set by taking all the DT images and lab with the label true and all the DF images with the label false and just run supervised learning to train this uh, discriminator. And we're going to use the symbol D5 of X to denote the probability that X is true according to our discriminator, which has parameters phi. And then we will use this discriminator to construct some kind of loss function for training g of z. One choice of loss function we could use is the negative log d of x. So d of x is the probability that x is real, log d of x is the log probability that it's real, and since we minimize the loss, we put a negative sign in front of it, so we minimize the negative log probability that it's real, which is like maximizing the log probability that it's real. So this recipe basically almost works but it has a few major problems that we need to address before we can construct a, a real viable method. So one uh, question we have to resolve is like, where do we get this initial generator? Uh, and then which loss function uh, do we use and how? Uh, if we do step five only once, basically if we just do step one, two, three, four, and five, the big problem is that in step five, it's very easy for G of Z to fool d of x. So if d of x was trained for um, fake images coming from a really bad generator, 
then the new generator that you get in step five just needs to be better than the old one, but it might still not be very realistic. So just doing it like this is not quite enough, and we need to slightly improve this recipe to get it to work really well. So here's what we actually do. We get our true data set, and then we get our generator with just random initialization, and then we're going to have an iterative procedure where we're going to sample our false images, and then we'll update our discriminator with only one gradient step. So we won't actually train the discriminator to convergence, we'll just take one gradient step. So that'll give us a slightly better discriminator. And then we will update our generator also for only one gradient step. And then we'll generate new false images. So instead of just generating all the false images up front and training your discriminator to convergence, you'll actually alternate between updating the discriminator to get better at classifying real from fake and then updating the generator to generate more realistic images. So it's going to be a kind of game where the discriminator will keep trying to keep up with the generator and the, and the generator will keep trying to fool it. And because they have this kind of competitive process, uh, then the only way for the generator to win the game is to produce images that are truly indistinguishable from real images. Um, in reality, there are a variety of different losses that we can construct that are all based on the discriminator probability, but they're all a little different, so I'll talk about that later. And they all, but they all have basically the same idea. So use the discriminator as a, as a realism score. So this basic recipe is called the Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN. It's generative because it generates images. It's adversarial because the discriminator and the generator are in competition. Uh, and it's a network because typically you instantiate this with, of course, neural networks. Okay, now um, we'll discuss the practicalities of actually implementing GANs in the next part of the lecture. But for now, I want to provide you with a little bit more intuition for why this basic idea actually works. Why is it that GANs actually learn distributions? Meaning, why, why does the generator actually use those random numbers to produce not just one realistic image, but actually a variety of realistic images? Well, what does G of Z want to do? Ideally, what G of Z would be most happy with is if it can somehow persuade the discriminator to output 0.5 for all generated images. You know, you're not going to get the discriminator to tell you that your images are more real than real, like, you know, reality is always going to have all true labels, so you're never going to be more real than real. So the best you can hope for is to get a score of 50%, which means the discriminator truly honestly cannot tell. The discriminator really thinks that your images are 50% likely to be false, 50% likely to be true. So that's the best that the generator can hope for. It basically can hope to convince the discriminator that it's completely ignorant, that the best it can do is guess 50-50. So how does the generator do this? Well, in order to really get the discriminator to guess 50-50, you have to generate images that look realistic, obviously, because if your images have something in them that is very indicative of being fake, then the discriminator will pick up on that, and it will be more confident that your images are fake, and you'll get probabilities less than 0 0.5. But the, the somewhat more subtle point is that in order to really get 0 0.5 on all of your generated images, you don't just need to generate images that look realistic, you actually need to generate all possible realistic images. And this is why GANs match distributions. So let me explain the second point. Why is it that the generator really needs to generate all possible realistic images rather than just one or two? I'll, dis I'll describe this on the next slide, but uh, what you might want to do is you might want to pause the lecture here and take a moment to think about this yourself. Why is it that in order to convince the discriminator to output 0.5 always, the generator needs to generate all possible realistic images. All right, so let's talk about this. Let's say that we have a data set that has photographs of cats and dogs. And let's say half the pictures are cats and half of them are dogs. Okay? And let's say that our generator has gotten really good at generating very realistic images. Okay? But it only generates dogs. So it has not covered the whole distribution. But it has figured out how to make the pixels look really good, okay? Well, imagine what the discriminator is going to do in this case. If we take a picture of a cat and we pass it to the discriminator, the discriminator will say, well, my training set had uh, about half the true images lay, uh, containing cats, but none of the false images contain cats. The false images only contain dogs. So if I get a cat, 
I can be certain that this came from the set of true images because a set of false images, the ones that were produced by the generator, never contained cats. So I'm going to say that the probability of true for this image is actually 1.0. Okay, but you can say, well, but at least the, the dogs are going to fool it, right? Well, no, because if you take a picture of a dog and you pass it into the discriminator, the discriminator will say, ah, okay, the true images, half of those were dogs, whereas for the false images, they were all dogs. So if you're showing me a dog, it's actually more likely to have come from the fake images because more of those are actually dogs. In fact, the particular probability that this, is, that this came from the true data set is one quarter, not one half. Because in the true images, half are cats, half are dogs. In the fake images, all of them are dogs. So even though this generator is generating photorealistic pictures of dogs, it is completely failing to fool the discriminator on both the cat images and the dog images. And this is why, in order for the generator to win the, the, this game against the discriminator, it really has to not only generate realistic images, but all of the realistic images. And that's what we want from unsupervised learning. We really want to capture the entire distribution. So the generator will do better if it not only generates realistic pictures, but if it generates all realistic pictures. Okay, now for full disclosure, I should mention at this point a particular issue with GANs that I will not talk about too much in this lecture, but this is something that you would learn about if you, um, uh, you know, read into the literature a little more. In reality, in practical instantiations, GANs do often suffer from something called the mode collapse problem. The mode collapse problem is a, a type of overfitting, basically. And when that happens, they do, in fact, fail to capture the entire distribution, so they might capture only dogs instead of dogs and cats. Now, that is a suboptimal solution. In that case, the discriminator will not output 50-50. It will actually figure out that you're failing a little bit. It's just that sometimes due to the difficulties of optimizing GANs or due to overfitting issues, uh, you might not actually uh, match the distribution. But if you correctly optimize the game and everything is done correctly, then you should match the distribution well. Okay, so uh, let's see some examples of GANs uh, in the literature. So these are images from the original paper that introduced uh, generative adversarial networks by Ian Goodfellow in 2014, called, appropriately enough, Generative Adversarial Networks. Uh, the images highlighted in yellow are real images um, from uh, MNIST, uh, a FACES data set, I think it's CIFAR 10 on the bottom, although I'm not completely sure. Um, and the images that are not circled in yellow are generated by the GAN. And you can see that this simple GAN was able to do a pretty good job of generating handwritten digits. So the handwritten digits, uh, top left, look very much like realistic handwritten digits. The faces look pretty good. They're like a little bit blurry in, in places, not quite as detailed or crisp as the real faces, but still pretty good. Uh, but then on the, on the more realistic pictures in the lower row, you know, it's kind of pictures that if you squint a little bit, if you're standing really far away, they look a little like real pictures but not very much so, so they're still pretty messy. Okay, but this was in 2014, so this was seven years ago. Since then, GANs have actually come a long way, including, for instance, algorithms that can generate very high-resolution GANs. This is not training data. These are actual images generated by a GAN based on the same principles as the 2014 GAN, but with a number of architectural improvements uh, to make the GAN work a lot better. These images are 1024 by 24 by 1024 in resolution, so these are HD resolution images. And probably if I hadn't told you that these are fake images, you wouldn't have you would not have been able to tell. So these are these are not real people. In fact, if you actually go through the training set, this is the Celeb AHQ data set, you will not find people that look like this. You will find similar looking people at the population level, but these are not specific individuals. These are actually generated fake pictures. Here's another example. Uh, this is actually comparing uh, three different methods. So the rightmost one is this progressively growing GANs, 2017, and the middle and left are some previous methods. And this is trained on a data set of bedroom photographs. And you can see that some of the older methods, you know, they still produce bedrooms that look kind of like bedrooms, but if you squint carefully, you'll sometimes notice a few structural flaws. Uh, like for example, a bed that is not perfectly straight or a window that curves a little bit. So Kind of the local details and textures all look correct, but some of the global structure is a little messed up. Uh, 
Uh, but the, uh, the more recent ones, the ones on the far right, really do look like real bedrooms, almost entirely. In a few places, you might notice like the perspective is a little warped, but mostly uh, it looks indistinguishable from photographs. Here are some uh, even more dramatic uh, recent examples. So this is uh, from a paper called Large-Scale GAN Training that introduces a model called Big GAN. Um, as the name might imply, Big GAN is very big, um, and it generates pictures that look indistinguishable from real pictures on very diverse classes. So the progressive GANs that you saw before, these are still somewhat narrow domains. So the GAN that generates faces was trained only on faces, and the GAN that generates bedrooms was trained only on bedrooms. Uh, this GAN was trained on a very diverse data set containing a huge variety of different images, um, and including uh, it was trained also to generate particular classes, and I'll talk about how to do that later. And it generates pictures that really do look, in many cases, indistinguishable from real ones. Of course, the breadth of the data set does sometimes lead to a little bit of com confusion. For example, if you look at the house in the lower left, you know, viewed from far away, it might look like a real house, but close up you can see that structurally it's a little bit off, like, you know, the, there's windows that are not really where windows should be and stuff like that. And of course, sometimes there's a little bit of, a, a, you know, erroneous generalization, like, for example, the tennis ball dog in the lower right corner, which, you know, it does look like a, a real picture in the sense that maybe this is like some kind of modern art exhibit, but it's uh, not really representative of either tennis balls or dogs, because tennis balls and dogs are not things that tend to blend together like that. Uh, but what's remarkable about this is that visually these really do look like a very, very realistic images. You can also use GANs to do some really interesting conditional generation. And we'll actually have a guest lecture from Philip Asola um, uh, in a few weeks where he'll discuss this in much more detail. But this is from a paper by Philip Asola called Image to Image Translation with Conditional Adversarial Lens where GANs are used to translate images from one domain to the other. For example, you could take an aerial, map, an aerial photograph and uh, translate it into a map. You could take a black and white image and translate it into, into a color image. You can translate a photograph of a road at night and translate it into an equivalent uh, road in the day. And a particularly fun tool you can play with, and you can look this up at just cats, you can train a GAN to translate between uh, line drawings and photographs of cats. And then you could draw a bread-shaped outline uh, and get a bread-shaped cat. And it will look, at least locally, kind of about as much as a bread-shaped cat could look realistic. 